Hello, and welcome to the Ricky Gervais Show. I'm Ricky Gervais, and with me, as always, is Steve Merchant. Hello. And Carl Pilkington. Carl, how have you been this weekend? Oh, it was mad. We followed an ant around the park, and Suzanne missed her doctor's appointment. <laughs> the, the flat has a ghost again. <laughs> you idiot! Shut up! I hate you, you stupid idiot! Oh, oh it's mad, isn't it? <laughs> no, guys, it's episode six. It's episode six of the Chapo Trap House. I'm Will Meneker, but uh, with me, as always, is Felix Biederman. What up? Matt Chrisman. What's up, bros? But... Uh, we got a treat for you guys. Joining us on episode six is I'm proud to introduce the Australian plug, Matt V. Brady. How you doing, Matt? Hey guys, how you going? Thanks for having me on the show. We're uh, we've gone international. Uh, Matt is coming to us all the way from Australia. Isn't the World Wide Web uh, a wonderful thing? He's here to put a shrimp on the Barbie of all discourse. <laughs> you know, we got that Steve Irwin plug, the Coke and the Crocodile. Yo, he's bringing us that kangaroo jack dope straight off the boat. Animal (laughs) Kingdom, what represent? Thanks for joining us. Uh, On this week's episode, we are mostly going to be discussing the film Batman vs. Superman that uh, we've all just seen. And uh, I I think there's... Dawn of Justice. You have to add the Dawn of Justice. (laughs) Well, uh, yes, yes, it is the dawn of justice. Um, I, I think there's a lot to talk about here. Uh, this this was a, a very interesting film. I felt hungover for most of Saturday um, just after having seen it because it was such a punishing uh, sort of visual and auditory experience. But uh, we have a lot to talk about. Yeah, uh, me, me and Will saw it together. We saw it at the same theater that we saw 13 Hours, and this will be the same theater in three years when we're on episode 300 at Chapo Trap House, and we have to see every, all four of James Cameron's Avatar movies and Batman vs. Superman 3, uh, <laughs> Justice Boy Pussy. <laughs> I'm tired. Just died. But, uh, yeah, we, it was a slog. Uh, and the first thing I said to Will once the movie ended was a lot going on there. <laughs> Indeed, there was quite a bit going on in Batman versus Superman, and I'm uh, very excited to, to break it all down with uh, these guys. But uh, before we do that, um, there's just a one thing that we think we need to address on last week's show we did mention that there would be a uh, profile of us coming out in uh, Mediaite on Tuesday and sure enough on Tuesday a profile of the Chapo Trap House by Sam Reisman uh, was up on Mediaite and um, it was pretty great I'm just going to read the headline here Uh, the headline is Meet Chapo Trap House the funniest and most fucked up new podcast about media and politics And uh, again, this is by Sam Reisman, and he goes on to write, uh, this is in our Chapo Press Clips section. He goes on to write, uh, Chapo Trap House is different from any of the roughly 10,000 other podcasts about politics in the media in that it's produced without a single shred of good taste, professionalism, or restraint, and has no qualms whatsoever with imagining the gory, shameful deaths of op-ed luminaries. So, I mean, I couldn't have asked for... A, you know, a better bit of press coverage from us, but, um, you totally I suppose, got it. You got it. I mean, there's only this, I mean, I couldn't have asked for it, but I actually, I paid for it. So we, well, you did. And that's the, the frustrating thing is that our, our plan to grow our, uh, read our listenership by doing kickbacks to media figures was uncovered by some incredibly perceptive sleuths in the comment section. I mean, I was going to I was going to start out by saying thanks, Sam Reisman, for writing a really great piece about us. But actually, I have to chastise him and block him because the way he wrote it, it was just too obvious to the the whip smart media commentariat that we paid him to do it. So, um, you know, and like we got called out for it, you know, so I think it's time now to we got to we got to cut the grass right now and uh, address some of these snakes that are in the media comment section talking shit about Trapo, <laughs> Chapo, I mean, and uh, starting off, um, uh, B hubs says, sounds like a favor for a buddy. I'll check it out. And then Everclay says, yep, or someone got a bit of a kickback. So, you know, right off the bat, these guys have us dead to rights. Fucking smart. That's the uh, thing about comment section people is that they're 
basically the smartest people on earth. <laughs> um, well, I think it's I think it's funny that people who can't afford kickbacks are jealous of people that can. Uh, just goes to show how the world works. It's easier to criticize than to work hard to get some money to pay off the media to plug your own podcast. Um, it's Smokey says, uh, so Reisman is pimping out some obscure internet nonsense. What's his cut to come out to be? Um, the answer is, uh, the, 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 whatever it costs for me to buy this new microphone that I'm speaking to you on now. But, um, we got the one from Democrat mafia. That oh, I got Democrat mafia queued up here. Uh, Democrat mafia says, I wonder how much media I charge these guys to write a story advertising their podcast. By the way, all three guys have less than 20,000 Twitter followers combined. If these guys are, quote, <laughs> minor stars, then so are about half a million other Twitter users. Okay, can, can I point something out? Uh, look, Democrat Mafia, I've always agreed with you. I've always respected you. But uh, if you know me, you know that I had around 20,000 followers, just myself alone, before I was banned from Twitter for asking Asma al-Assad for feed pics. <laughs> <laughs> the thing I like about Democrat Mafia is that just his his avatar and his name tell me that he's the guy who comments on every article about any kind of LBG t uh, achievement, you know, like someone comes out in a, in a field like sports or something and says, why is this news? <laughs> <laughs> well, we actually, we had, we had a couple friends uh, reply to Democrat mafia. I'm looking at it right here. Uh, Jezer said after his first comment, I didn't even know Arthur Chu had a discus account. <laughs> And then Democratic Mafia comes straight back after that with, um, am I supposed to Google who that is now? Is that how this works? <laughs> well, what a shock. Uh, Mediaite's least woke commenter, which is no small achievement, doesn't know who the greatest POC of all time is. <laughs> And then, uh, and then Parm from Twitter showed up and said, let's see your follower, follower account, Democrat Mafia. And then he comes straight back with, I have over 100,000 followers. So sure, tell me your Twitter handle and I'll DM you. That didn't work out the way you expected, did it? Whoops. <laughs> um, his own logic has been used to prove his point. Oh my God. I searched, but the thing is, I searched Twitter uh, for the handle Democrat Mafia and I couldn't find Zilch. There is nothing. So Maybe he has a hundred thousand followers on like Discus or some other social media network for old people. My, or he's actually Neil Cavuto. That's my theory. <laughs> you, know who, you know who fucking kills it on Discus? Who like we should have sent as our uh, Luca Brasi, the beer nerd. Yeah, <laughs> beer nerd. So sam samurai of Discus. Yeah, he's the Ronin. <laughs> you just cut swaths through these bitches. You fucking wreck that dude. <laughs> well, a lot of a lot of the Chapo Nation did show up in the comments section to say that either we have not condemned the war crimes of Assad, and then uh, they responded to a lot of people by saying that we they've proven our own point with their logic. So I just want to say thank you. We've, this is what happens when you train. When you when, <laughs> this is what happens when you train your soldiers well and like yeah. you just see them do combat, and it just fills you with pride. Chapo Chap House has become like a uh, William S. Burroughs esque word virus that. <laughs> transmitting prodromal schizophrenia through the airway. <laughs> I would I would hate it if I just like commented on something and forgot about it and I check my email and there's fifty notifications from Discus like fucking like woke Assad commented on your post. Uh wow. They just proved your point with your own logic. Wow, ad hominem. Show me the feet, sweetie. <laughs> I would fucking end myself. <laughs> Suck. And there's a, sorry, just w one more snake that needs to be addressed. One more snake that we need to expose. Uh, Steve Richter uh, chimed in with some very thoughtful comments. Steve Richter said, they are talking about Bernie Sanders and no one mentions that his policy proposals do not make sense. Parentheses, read daily news editorial. <laughs> nothing on Bernie, nothing on Bernie being a socialist, meaning government owns everything. And how can a conscientious, conscientious objector order a bomb to be dropped on terror cells? It's, uh, someone. This is in response to someone who said, "Actually, this show is good." 
<laughs> in response to that, he said, what? The show is good because they do not mention that Sanders makes no sense? This is the kind of elephant in the room with all Democrat politicians and policy ideas. Black Lives Matter is baloney. Just study in school, show up on time for work, and do not resist arrest. Trump and Sanders are showing you do not need big donor money to run for office. Even big banks are fine in that there is nothing they do to harm other parts of the economy or even small banks. <laughs> wow, you know that Bill Clinton had a disco account. <laughs> I like and also, it. I like that he brings up Black Lives Matter because I don't think we've uh, the only time we've even tangentially brought up Black Lives Matter is to like subtle is to like sort of very gingerly make fun of D Ray. So, uh, Steve, well, these guys, uh, Black listening. Lives Matter is like the it is the nightmare that all of these guys collectively share with some black person coming up to them. It's basically a politicized knockout game thing because you could almost argue that the knockout game was sort of like a Freudian, like uh, anxiety anticipation. Like they knew that this was coming, you know, this sort of black uh, political assertion of rights and the tremors, the time quake was going in both directions and, and the anxiety about getting knockout gamed was sort of this, uh, this sub- it's like when dogs can sense that an earthquake's going to happen. <laughs> it was their concern about the knockout game. So this is like all that knockout game anxiety has finally found a political target. Yeah. I just love that yeah. his, uh, his advice here is uh, study in school, show up on time for work, and do not resist arrest. Okay. Steve, Steve, Richter, Steve Richter wakes up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat screaming, why don't you wear a suit? People might respect you more. <laughs> but here's the punchline to Steve Richter. Uh, his last comment was, I listened for a little bit. It was okay. Gavin McGinnis and his show is much funnier. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Uh, we have failed, guys. Steve, the so only reason I put, we put this thing together is so that we could have a funnier podcast than Gavin McGinnis and race realist Wonka, or whatever the fuck he has as a co-host. <laughs> no, I mean, Steve, just like bear with us. Just please trust us. Next week, we are going to have on um, uh, race realist Tim and a guy with tattoos to tell us about the red pill. I mean, I am personally sick of losing my audience to Gavin McGinnis. This has sort of been a problem since I got online. So this is going to be my last episode of <laughs> Crap House. I'm Australian, so I'm coming at this from an outsider's perspective. But I have often wondered when listening to the podcast why you guys don't address why Bernie Sanders doesn't pull up his pants. <laughs> it's just so frustrating. I mean, we try to put a good podcast together. You know, we bring all this energy into it. We, I think that we're pretty knowledgeable. But – None of us have been able to do anything as funny or as insightful as, say, in a bad Scottish accent that black people's skulls are shaped funny. <laughs> I, actually, I, I didn't know Gavin McGinnis had a podcast, but then I remembered that I saw some brief clip of it was like a it was like a, a Skype chat. Uh, that he was recording for his podcast and he had on his guest was this sort of like uh, anemic looking ginger from like his comment section who defends social justice warrior talking points. And like he, the guy was trying to get a word in going, uh, you know, Gavin, when people call me a social justice warrior, like it's a bad thing. Like I just get confused because I think social justice is good. And like before he could even spit that out, like Gavin had cut him off and was screaming over him. You will never get laid. You will never get laid. That was the sound of a million pussies drying up that I just heard. So he's basically so he's got his own Alan Combs. Is that what you're saying? I know. He just has on some like some weak ass guests that he can just like abuse. Uh you know, Alan Combs. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, basically. Um, well, I didn't want you to bring it up, but yes, I have been on other podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and one final one. I didn't even save it, but there was some asshole in the media uh, comments who said podcast more like audio file. And I just want to say uh, I'm, I was definitely not mad at that comment at all. I, it was funny to me. And I was so not mad that I went out and spent a hundred dollars on a microphone that I'm now using to record the podcast. So um, I'm basically just throwing money at this little bitch right now. It's, it's nothing to stunt for me. No, it's just like basically we, we love the fans of the show, like the people who listen and say they like us. You know, that's great. We like you. But we love our haters. 
there's nothing we love more than our haters. And there's nothing that we're like less mad about than getting, getting hate online. Because if you're not, it, it, it means that you're not shining. What did Kevin Gates say? I want to say thank you to my haters for making me invincible. They've yeah, they've basically made us invincible. So again, thanks to Sam Reisman. Um, like the week before that, it was the AV Club. Uh, now it's Mediaite. I'm thinking uh, this show is going to get in BuzzFeed. But like my real goal is that we get written up in the Federalist. So if you know anyone who writes for the Federalist and wants to, you know, cover media, the cutting edge of like the most unprofessional, fucked up, crazy show. Please put them on to us because I want to get written up by the Federalist and, and oh, preferably, preferably Molly Hemingway. Molly She's, Hemingway a, dime. Is She's a dime. This is why the West is failing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, again, th- thanks for uh, everyone uh, for the, thanks to Sam for the write up and uh, for all the haters in the comments. But um, now we must move along to the uh, the topic of today's show is, as we said at the beginning, uh, Zack Snyder's Batman vs. Superman. So, uh, first of all, uh, how was your guys theater experience seeing this movie? Um, I saw it in a theater that I think had three other people in it. <laughs> I was sitting right up the back and they were down, right down the front. Um, one of the guys had his shoes off and his feet up on the seat. <laughs> that was the atmosphere, basically. That Wait, I, um, I thought that was required at Australian movie theaters. <laughs> <laughs> no, you- no shoes, no problem, mate. Was someone picking their teeth with a giant knife uh, next to you? <laughs> Uh, no, I wrong? wasn't. I did not see the movie of Paul Hogan, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> he's currently hiding from the size of an oil barrel. In <laughs> uh, Matt, how was your how was your movie theater experience? It was good. A friend and I saw it. Uh, there were maybe yeah about four or five other people in the theater. Nobody put, took their shoe their shoes off because we're we live in a civilized country. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just quiet. Nobody talked. Sadly, I could I frankly would have really appreciated some talk back. Uh, I would have just anything to. It was mostly us actually because for the first the first twenty minutes, my friend and I were just dying laughing at how absurdly grim and over the top traumatic it was. Uh, there was somebody with a kid. <laughs> But like not a little kid, like maybe a teen, like maybe a uh, a tween or something. They didn't start crying at any point, which was frankly kind of uh, surprising to me. <laughs> I think there was a kid in uh, in our theater, but um, it, like I said, Felix and I saw it in, in the same movie theater, uh, the the Court Street uh, Theater in downtown Brooklyn that we saw thirteen hours at, and it's like the Secret Soldiers of Benghazi. Yeah, it, it's like sort of a megaplex. It's it's kind of a dingy theater. It wasn't like. I just it, it wasn't as good as the time we saw 13 hours because I don't think there was an operator in the theater when we saw 13 hours the guy in front of us I'm pretty sure was an operator so we, <laughs> I, I couldn't laugh as uproariously as I would have otherwise but um, the, the best part about when we saw 13 hours is that like so you like you come in and it's always a scrum it's like a very tiny like like ground floor and then there's like you know 11 floors of movie theaters and you have to get in an elevator so everyone has to pile in this elevator and we got in an elevator with this woman and then like it's one of those elevators with two doors so like the, the the back door kept opening and like opening into this like loading dock or something and i didn't know what was going on because um i was extremely high at the time so i oh, forgot to forgot to mention that earlier but <laughs> so already i was feeling like you know i i just think like at any point they're just like you know gonna take me out of the theater and be like i'm sorry you, you can't see this movie right now who, what are you kidding um but we got on the elevator with a woman who uh proceeded to tell us that she was seeing uh the film 50 shades of black the uh the marlon wayne's uh, 50 shades of gray parody for the second time and the reason she was seeing it for the second time was because she said she hurt herself from laughing so hard the first time and had to leave the theater <laughs> that's cute that's cute that she's seeing it that she was seeing it twice that's adorable I only saw it four times in the theater, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, uh, Matt, you mentioned the, uh, you know, the how you were laughing and how unrelentingly grim this um, sort of superhero uh, comic book movie was. Uh, first of all, um, 
I, I think it should have come with a, a warning. The very opening, the very beginning of the movie definitely triggered my 9-11 issues. And oh I think God. there should have been a warning of some oh, kind. Yeah. So what, what, yeah, what I was breaking, like what we were laughing at, I just couldn't stop laughing. It's like, so basically the second or third shot in the film is the, is a close up of a dead woman's face with gunpowder stippling on her cheek. That's uh, Martha Wayne. Then, uh, Bruce Wayne's mom, because we have to see Bruce Wayne's parents die in every Batman movie ever made. That was the fir- that was the first time I came during the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I personally can't wait for the far future when Batman's parents get killed with uh, ray guns because that's going to happen. <laughs> Did, uh, uh, did you guys happen to notice I, I, what movie they were coming out of, too? Excalibur. It was Excalibur, the John yeah, Borman because, movie, yeah. Because what more fitting movie to take your eight-year-old child to than Excalibur? <laughs> but that's appropriate, because it's just as fucked up to take your eight-year-old to see this fucking thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's very so true. The second shot is a dead woman's face with bullet with the fucking powder on her cheek. Now, okay, uh, in in this, uh, like, the, 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 the Batman genesis of uh, seeing his parents get gunned down there was one um in, in the Zack snyder version of this story uh there there is one like notable difference from other incarnations of this mythology that i thought was important and that is the guy who mugs them he shoots them because uh thomas wayne bruce wayne's father um, like he balls up his fist, like he's gonna like, de- like yeah, he goes for it, forced to like defend his family, and every and like, and that's why he gets shot, and that's why both him and his wife get killed in front of Bruce, right? Like in almost every other in every other version of this story, like the the bad guy, the the mugger just shoots them like un- unprompted, right? Yeah, yes. in cold blood. Yeah. And in this one, it was like you know his, his dad tried to tried to you know attack the mugger, so in a way, the you know. Well, you know, it's because it's justified. Of, it was what I'm saying, right? But it also, I think, frankly, for Snyder, it would be more of an indictment of Thomas Wayne if he hadn't tried to fight back, because right. Snyder is such a, a, a worshiper of violence for its own sake and, and force. He basically agrees with Ra's al Ghul in Batman Begins when he said that Thomas Wayne was a coward. Yeah, like, yeah. He, um, he agrees that the that the Nolan version of Thomas Wayne was a bitch, basically. So he had to make his Thomas Wayne. Not only is he played by uh, the guy who plays uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, Morgan yeah. fucking badass comedian. But yeah, he's got to go for the punch. Just be like, my Thomas Wayne is not a fucking bitch, okay? Just right off the bat, you fucking <laughs> cool, and he I, fights, even though it's gonna get him killed. I have to say, this is my first issue with the movie. This was the most unrealistic thing in the entire movie, by the way. Uh, if you guys know about the twenty-one foot rule. If a skilled <laughs> or unarmed combatant is within 21 feet of a thug scumbag with a firearm, he will always disarm him. But, you know, I guess accuracy doesn't matter to big Hollywood Snyder. No, he, I chalk it up to Thomas Wayne just being an effete billionaire who had only fought, you know, in like maybe he did Muay Thai or something. But, uh, I put it down to him being uh, just a bit fired up after seeing Helen Mirren's tits with his son <laughs> sitting next to him in the theater. Those are the kind of moments you never forget as a father. I would, <laughs> I, I would have to say then that movie becomes realistic because he came in his pants during that movie and he violated No Fap November. <laughs> not high enough to disarm the knockout game scumbag piece of shit who killed his wife. Yeah, and I guess this is the other uh, the other uh, twist on the uh, the Batman Genesis story. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll get more into the specifics of this later, but it, it was a little hard to tell. It was a bit of ethnically ambiguous casting, but the but the punk scumbag who murders Thomas and Martha Wayne was unmistakably POC. We know what kind of POC he was. Me and Will know, but this is he was Kurdish. Remember that. Remember that. We, we will we're have gonna a come, we're gonna come back to this later. <laughs> we will have a holistic theory. Remember, Mountain Turk. <laughs> <laughs> so, so first thing you see in the movie basically is this woman's dead face, and then three seconds later they go to Bruce Wayne trying to save his employees from the big fight in Metropolis that ended Man of Steel. And not only do you see all of his uh, employees die in the Wayne, uh, the, the Wayne Finance Building collapse, that is exactly like 9-11. This is the most obvious 
almost it was it's like a it's like gus van sant psycho shot for shot remake of 9 11. <laughs> it's like, he's literally batman is literally running into the gusting debris uh smoke which is something you usually don't see in action movies where buildings collapse that's one of those messy realities that they don't deal with but here no you get the smoke no they, they, they went for the realism but they went for the realism but you don't just get that he calls up the guy who runs it presumably one of his employees and says you got to get out which is kind of hilarious because these uh, yeah no matt i yeah, I, made, I made note of that scene like I, like so bruce yeah. wayne is rushing into metropolis to save an entire building of his employees and he calls like the head of you know wayne finance in metropolis who's on the 40th floor of this office building clearly watching some sort They're of like watching these guys alien mothership people. destroy metropolis and bruce wayne goes you got to get everyone out evacuate the building now and he's like yes sir all right everybody get out and it's just like wait you were yeah. waiting for him to tell you to do that it really underlined um, that Batman must be such an asshole of a boss if his employees are too terrified to inva- evacuate before yeah. he gives them. <laughs> Wayne Enterprises clearly operates on the Fuhrer principle. <laughs> uh, I, not only do you get that, he gets the moment to realize he's going to die after the building gets cut in half by uh, eye lasers. And then he starts praying. You get a close up of a man coming to realization of his own death. The only thing it didn't include was uh, someone just making the choice to jump out of the building rather than be burned alive. Yeah. I would, like to, I would like to point out that the head of Wayne Finance looked exactly like Ron Fournier. <laughs> and, like Ron Fournier. <laughs> and so the reason that they didn't evacuate the building was that Ron Fournier was like, well, the aliens are cutting down the building but elevators break sometimes. <laughs> yep, yep. I really think that Zod and and Superman need to stop fighting and and create some sort of uh, settlement that is good for both parties. When he's when he's praying, he's just saying in Latin, "Love that boy." <laughs> 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 Again, that, that that's one of those like fifty percent jokes. We'll see, we'll see how many people pick up on that one. Uh, what but... I'm doing right now is called the Clifford Vickery. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to make one other point about uh, what an asshole Bruce Wayne is as a boss. So, like after you see like this building get pancaked like exquisitely, like collapsing into it, just imploding into itself, um, in you know probably a better controlled demolition than the one that brought down the uh, the World Trade Center. But, yeah, um, seriously, Halliburton should have been taking notes for the future if they do it again. Um, <laughs> so Bruce Wayne r- sort of r- is, runs into the wreckage to save people, and one of the people that he comes across is like a security guard for Wayne Industries. That, and this guy comes into the play later, but like his legs are crushed under like a, an I beam or something, and he's like he's like uh, looks at his name tag and he's like Greg, Greg, are you okay? And then his security guard, whose legs are crushed, and he's going, I can't feel my legs. I can't feel my legs, goes, you're the boss, boss. And it's like, I feel like <laughs> at that point, if he had called him, like, Bruce or, or, or you know, Wayne or whatever, he would have just, like, left him there. Just be like, don't ever, don't ever address me like that. That guy was already thinking of uh, all his medical bills and how he needed to get them paid on his health insurance. So uh, th- th- we're introduced to Bruce Wayne um, uh, it, during Metro- Metropolis's 9-11. But, you know, again, that triggered a lot of issues for me, uh, you know, being from New York City and whatnot. And I wish they would have warned me going into the movie. But um, I thought the tone for the movie was actually set a little bit later when after that scene, we're introduced to Superman for the first time. We're actually, we're introduced to Lois Lane for the first time as she witnesses um, an Al-Shabaab militia execute Jimmy Olsen, who is also in the CIA. By the way, he doesn't even get a name in the movie. But that I, that was Jimmy Olsen, right? No, it was. Yeah, it is. And uh, this tells you a lot about Zack Snyder in that he thought that was a funny joke that Jimmy Olsen gets ruthlessly executed by a bullet to the head without ever his, having his name spoken. <laughs> Zack Snyder thought that was a really funny little Easter egg for the fans. The fans it's will just, love that. It's just a little, uh, just a little cap, cap, cap tip for the fans. Jimmy, in, in Zack Snyder's universe, like the, the people on Twitter who are like, say that reporters are feds, they're actually vindicated for once. They're totally like, <laughs> 
<laughs> Jimmy Olsen was a CIA psyop. Well, in, in reality, there is only one guy that good, and his name is Michael Weiss, and he looks like Matt Brady. <laughs> but, uh, in, what reality, if I- in, in Zack Snyder universe, like all the tanky people are like, Jimmy Olsen's a fucking fed. How did he know <laughs> that Superman was going to be here? And then he gets what's coming to him. He gets what all feds have coming to them. Blah, blah. <laughs> no, so uh, Lois Lane is reporting on a story from like uh, Africa Stan in Africa. Yeah, I believe it was yes. like, Nam- Namaria. It was like it was, it was called Namar- Namaria. Namaria it was, was it? Because yeah. something afterwards in the film, they only ever refer to it as, and I'm using quotation marks here, the desert. Yeah, <laughs> well, I was like Nairobi. Like they took Nairobi and changed one letter, something like that. They didn't want to pay the Nairobi um, tourism board the license fee to yeah. use their name in a movie. But um, it, I, I assume that they were Al Shabab. But um, basically, Lois gets a gun put to her head, and then Superman shows up. Presumably, he was like halfway around the planet, you know, got got wind that Lois is in trouble, and comes and saves her. But he didn't do that for Jimmy. Yeah, like, fuck that guy. He's a fan. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Superman, Olsen. There actually is some indication in the movie that Superman's kind of a tanky, so uh, <laughs> kind of makes sense. Yeah, in, in Zack Snyder's world, Superman is like half tanky and half D Ray. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally true. Because, uh, yeah, no, there's one point in the movie where uh, Superman is, uh, Clark, Clark Kent, rather, is arguing with his editor about, like, what stories they choose to and not choose to cover. And he's like, he's like, when you when you ignore the disadvantage, you're making a choice. And, like, as a paper, our job is to tell the truth about what's happening in Ferguson. Yeah, and he actually points out that Batman most, mostly just beats up poor people. Which is a good That's point. True. That's not very point. And then, later on... He's they, a millionaire who beats up poor people. Yeah. They put a they put a little cherry on that when Perry White is yelling at him for being too idealistic and saying the WPA isn't hiring. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. But uh, what's so frustrating about that is that's actually an interesting thing to do with Superman. But because it's an interesting thing to do with Superman, you can't do it for more than two seconds because Be- Snyder needs to basically make Superman as unpleasant as possible due to yeah. his, his long term plan of degrading him because of his deep, deep hatred for the character. I want to point out that like they do the classic conservative movie. This is like a throwback to eighties movies where like Superman brings up a very good moral point that Batman isn't really stopping crime, he's just assaulting poor people <laughs> by having the guy that Batman beats up make him a child molester. And that's like that's like complex moral philosophy for conservatives who are like, oh yeah, well, would you defend a child molester? Because I, well, I would fucking skin him alive. That's That brings up, that's another thing that I thought was amazing, because that's like the fourth scene in the movie, when Batman rescues these women from this sex a- trafficking. Asian women. Yeah, and he chains the guy shirtless to a radiator in this dark, empty house and brands his skin. Brands him. Yeah. It's literally <laughs> like a scene from Seven. But like, and I just imagine some kid going to his dad, Daddy, why are those women in cages? And he's got to go, well, son, when a man wants to make money, sometimes he brings women across the ocean and charges men to have sex with them. You know, it, the Bat brand is a, a total Zack Snyder invention as well. I've never oh, yeah. seen that reference anywhere yeah. in the comics, but he just had to get that in, that he brands men before sending them into jail oh, to be definitely. killed. Yes, they, they explicitly say that they get killed in prison if they have the brand, which I don't Why? Understand. Why, though? You think that there would be solidarity. Yeah, oh, you, you think, think there would be respect. You, up too? you yeah, think they'd be superstars. Yeah. It's like, yeah, man, Batman beat me up, not some fucking asshole cop. Yeah, it's like if you go to jail for killing a cop, like it's sort of like people respect you. If you go to jail because Batman fucking, you know, fucked your shit up, I mean, people would be like, yeah, I respect that. You know, fair is fair. I mean, like, we, we, we established that this movie... Just like if you pick up the actual film reel, there's coke dust on it. Like this movie has, <laughs> but it's a combination of doing coke and conservative memes. Like conservatives love like the moral world. They love the idea of like moral bikers who like go and beat oh, up yeah. Westboro Baptist Church and kill child molesters in prison. Um, well, th- he th- th- uses th- guns a lot in this movie. <laughs> Yeah, he uses funny, guns quite a bit. I remember when when the trailer came out, and there's a there's a shot of him with a gun, and it was from uh, that ridiculous idiotic dream sequence. 
Oh, and man. People, like, people freaked out because why does he have a gun? Why does he have a gun? And people were like, I think it's a dream sequence. Don't worry. But guess what? He still uses guns all the time in this movie. <laughs> yes. Not just in the dream sequence. Yeah, no, I mean, he... Snyder went out of his way to like uh, make the pains that like this is set in the real world. This is the real world, which I, you know, like like for instance in the nine eleven opening, I thought that that was kind of like a conscious uh, refutation of the Marvel cinematic universe, right? Like yeah. we're, we're at the end of the Avengers, like an alien army like invades the middle of Manhattan, but seemingly like buildings are raised and like you know they do battle and like the Hulk is jumping everywhere, like leveling shit, but seemingly nobody dies in any of that. Like there are no casualties whatsoever whereas like in Zack Snyder's version it's like when Superman and Zod fight each other and I give him I give him props for this like he makes it clear that like thousands of innocent people are dying as this is going on in Zack Snyder's universe like the Green Lantern is going to commit Sabra and Shatila <laughs> <laughs> Like Lieutenant Lieutenant Callie gets imbued with powers. <laughs> if, if, he, if he did a Black Panther movie, he would literally just murder cops. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I have to say though that the impulse to to ask the question, "What if superheroes were real?" is the stupidest question you can ask. <laughs> And it really is. In the year 2016, maybe in the 1980s it was different, you know, in the Alan Moore heyday and everything. But if you're still asking the question 20, 30 years later, dude, what would it be like if there really were superheroes? You're a moron and you shouldn't be in charge of making these movies. Yeah, well, Zack, that, Snyder, Zack Snyder should not even be allowed to drive a car, much less be. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you brought up Alan Moore and uh, Zack Snyder was the guy who did the Watchmen uh, movie, right? Which was like pretty much a shot for shot recreation of the comic book that nonetheless managed to miss almost every point about the comic book that like that it was actually about like Zack Snyder like read the comic and was like Rorschach is a hero if only <laughs> if only we had people strong enough to stand up to scum like him where it was like quite explicitly like Alan Moore was like writing that character like you were supposed to be revolted and repelled by him and, and he, he probably likes the comedian too he probably really likes that guy as well I'm sure that he thinks that Heisenberg is badass as hell and that Skyler's a bitch. Yeah. Well, oh, Zack Snyder definitely called Skylar a bitch. <laughs> Zack Snyder has like 400 posts on Reddit slash R like Heisenberg secret stash <laughs> where he posts, where he like posts like 5,000 page <laughs> fan fictions about Walter White killing Skylar. <laughs> He's a, he definitely, he has his own Joker makeup. <laughs> well, that's, that's the thing that I kind of realized watching this movie is that, so Zack Snyder keeps making these superhero movies, but he clearly thinks that he is sort of above them. You know, he thinks that he, he, it, that they, that this kind of material is below his sort of aesthetic level. And that the reason he keeps making them, it seems to me is that, is that he is fascinated by, by these, the tropes of superheroes, but not the hero part, the super part. Like he is fascinated by like anyone having that kind of power. And, and I think the power fantasy of superheroes is incredibly intriguing to him. And he just get, gets off on it on like a libidinal level. And so, but movies like this and the superhero canon, the whole thing that is compelling is that you you kind of put yourself in the place of some of these guys, right? You like if you in a Batman sort of a Superman movie, sort of what's compelling to a degree is which one are you rooting for, right? Which one do you identify more with? And I realized watching it uh, that Zack Snyder identifies with Lex Luthor <laughs> more than either Batman or Superman, because Lex Luthor basically he wants these guys to fight for no reason at all other than he just doesn't like them and the thing he doesn't like specifically about superman because it's mostly about superman he does he kind of is, batman's sort of just a handy person for him to fight the thing he hates about superman is his pretensions of being good because for snyder that kind of power is to be exercised without restraint like when he thinks of superman he's thinking of superman in the nietzschean randian sense you know and anyone who would have that kind of power and would willingly submit to earthly morality is a fraud and a weakling and needs to be brought down. And all, right, this whole, yeah, all these movies are Snyder shitting on Superman because he's disgusted by the fact that he will not just assert the power that he has. 
let's let's talk i mean let's talk about lex luther because lex luther completes the triage of sexual pathologies in the movie Superman is he has sex. He has sex with a woman, but he has sex with a woman, but we but that's just the we have that's a front. I mean he's in he's he's in the closet. Uh Batman is Valso. He's gay Valso. Uh well let's define our terms here for the listeners. Valso means voluntarily celibate. Yes. And well, what about that girl in his bed? Was she uh, like, there, Matt, was there were a lot of hallucinations in this movie. There were a lot of dream sequences. That was another dream sequence. <laughs> yeah. Malcolm Harris, I mean Lex Luthor. <laughs> <laughs> he is incel. And incel in Zack Snyder's universe is like that's the most powerful. There's no one more powerful than an incel. An incel can create beings from other worlds and bring them to light with their like with their incel blood. Could we talk about the scene where he makes Holly Hunter drink his urine? Uh, what's urine? I never heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about piss, mate. Oh, You're wow. taking it. Yeah, the Todd Starnes shout out scene. <laughs> so Holly Hunter is the, uh, the the senator who wants to I don't know regulate Superman or something. Yeah, it's never explained. She's like, uh, no. Yeah, she's, she's like, a big government lib who wants Superman <laughs> to uh, from to, Kentucky. <laughs> Yeah, she like she's like if John Kerry in two thousand four tried to regulate Superman because like it just it's like oh I was for him saving lives before I was against it. <laughs> I don't know how the real world works. Um, no, yeah, and then uh, she she says at one point to to Lex, um, uh, you can pee you can pee in a jar and call it Grandma's sweet tea, but it's still piss or something like that. And then right before uh, Luther has her assassinated, he puts assassinated, he puts assassinated.